He'll turn over to the book of Jonah. We'll uh, pick up where we left off last week. Before we begin, though, let's uh, bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these Old Testament writers who set forth the principles that guide us today, that leave us, leave, leave us examples of what to follow and what not to follow. We pray their blessing upon us as we study this word. May we be enriched by it and be, be, be better prepared for the master's use. In his name we pray, amen. <clears throat> you know, all, all these uh, Old Testament prophets are very interesting individuals and what they have to say, very interesting. Jonah is interesting in that uh, he, was, he didn't want to do what God had instructed him to do. Now, I don't know if he was a, uh, you know, there was a Jonah that was uh, a prophet to Jeroboam the <clears throat> second, And Jeroboam the second, of course, was a king of Israel, and all the kings of Israel bad. So I don't know if uh, Jonah thought he had a vested interest, but uh, this nation of Assyria, of which Nineveh was the capital, uh, Jonah didn't like that nation at all. He wanted the nation to be destroyed, not to be uh, saved. So when he was instructed to go preach to Nineveh, and he uh, tried to run and hide, but he was, uh, and to the uh, mariners, he described himself as a Hebrew, one who followed God. And so it's kind of Interesting that he thought that he could hide from God, but it may be that he thought, well, if I'm so far away from uh, Nineveh, and he was headed to Tarshish, which is in Spain, if I'm so far away, God can't possibly use me to do this. He should have realized that there's nothing impossible with God even though we may try to frustrate God's purposes, he will still accomplish uh, what he set out to accomplish. His word will not uh, return to him void. He, he will do what he said he'll do. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Jonah is in the uh, ship. A storm comes up, very tempestuous storm. <clears throat> much worse than the rainstorm we just had. It was a very bad storm. And it was the uh, feeling of these uh, heathen people, very su superstitious people, that there, there's got to be some cause for this. It's not a matter of things just naturally happen. There has to be a cause of it. But in this case, there really was a cause. And when they had uh, cast lots to determine who was the perpetrator of this. It turned out that it was Jonah, and he confessed. He told him exactly what he's doing, that he was running from God. You know, he was a Hebrew. He was running from God. He didn't want to do what God had told him to do. And that because of that, God had caused this storm. Well, that uh, impressed the uh, mariners for sure. And they wanted to know what could be done to alleviate the storm and, and much to Jonah's credit to his uh, uh, bravery if you, you might say it uh, he just said well what you have to do you have to pick me up and cast me into the sea well, they may have been impressed by that too and they may have wanted to do anything they could to prevent that from happening so they rode you know the boat they rode hard to bring the uh, ship to land, but they couldn't do it because the storm was very uh, tempestuous and it was growing more so as time went by. 
So here in verse uh, 14 of chapter 1, they said uh, they cried out to the Lord. Now, just because they cried out to the Lord doesn't mean they ceased to be heathens. They were still heathens. And he said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let uh, uh, us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Now, they, they were also praying to every other god that they, they could think of. So this, this doesn't mean that they were proselytes, if you will, to the Hebrew religion. They were very impressed by the Hebrew religion and by the Hebrew God, but that doesn't mean that they ceased to be heathens. But it's still interesting that they uh, had this thought that if they cast Jonah into the sea, that they would be held responsible for his blood. And they didn't want to be held responsible. They said, we don't want to be held responsible for this innocent blood. <clears throat> well, he was, Jonah wasn't innocent by any means, but they still didn't want to be charged with it. And it's interesting to note that uh, when uh, Pilate was trying to let Jesus go, and the uh, those that were bitten, or crying for his crucifixion, uh, uh, Pilate wanted to know why. You know, this, he's innocent. Why? Why do you want me to crucify him? They just cried all the more. So he uh, brought had some water brought out and washed his hands. And said, "I'm innocent of the blood of this uh, individual Jesus." And the Jews said. Let his blood be upon us and our children. I think I pointed out last week that indeed it was visited upon them. The guilt was visited upon the Jewish people. Many years since and many times. So one shouldn't wish for what uh, the consequences that they cannot by any stretch of the imagination, contemplate. But anyway, here in verse 15, they, they picked up uh, Jonah and threw him in the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Well, that had to impress the men. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, I don't know what this sacrifice was, and I don't know what the vows were, and, and I don't think they ceased being heathens. But they were duly impressed by the fact that as soon as they did what Jonah said must be done to uh, alleviate the storm, the storm subsided. Deeply impressed by that. <clears throat> so it says in verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. <clears throat> now this prepared, uh, some have thought that uh, God miraculously uh, created a fish to swallow Jonah. That's not what the word prepared means. It means that there was a appointed a creature. I, I don't know what kind of fish it was. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's some sort of sea creature of sufficient size to f swallow Jonah. But that fish was appointed and it was there in the right place at the right time to swallow Jonah. Now the miracle, of course, is that uh, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That just doesn't happen, <laughs> unless it's a miracle. And there are many detractors that say, well, this, it is impossible for that to happen, so this has to be a, uh, a myth. Well, not so with a miracle. Uh, certainly, Jonah was not able to breathe or because of the gastric juices of fish or any other creature that swallows things whole. Uh, it's impossible uh, without a miracle of that individual or creature surviving within the uh, innards of a creature. There have been situations where uh, pythons of sufficient size have swallowed humans. 
and then when they were uh, discovered and and the humans were retrieved from the valley of the python uh, it was in a, a state of advanced decay if you will so those uh, uh, stomach acids of those sorts of creatures very very strong so without a miracle Jonah could not have survived in the belly of the fish three days and three nights but this should not be so hard for the uh, Christian at least to accept uh, Jesus did he act was he actually crucified was he actually in the tomb three days and was he actually raised from the dead well if we can believe that and if you're a Christian you do believe that then it's not such a stretch to uh, believe this also in fact Jesus used this as an example of what would happen to him that this would be the sign he would uh, you know the Jews are asking him for sign he said I give you the sign of Jonah so uh, he was predicting his own death and the fact that he would be in the earth for three days and three nights so it's not such a stretch of the imagination and, and as I said before that Jonah is written as history and when an inspired writing uh, presents events as historical they are in fact historical now historical events may not be inspired and, and could be uh, erroneous but an inspired writing that that is presented as a, an historical account is in fact historical and Jonah is written as history yes sir As John. That's one of the ways that you counteract those in the text. Yeah. They don't give a problem. You wrote a whole book on the Jonah and defending it against those. And people think it's just crazy for the miracle. If you allow a miracle, there's no problem with it. No problem at all. So, you know, I think the uh, detractors of Jonah are just are uh, grasping at the straw, really. And they're really denying the inspiration of the Bible when they uh, maintain that it's. Even if they even if they maintain it's allegorical, it's still uh, they're still denying the history of it, which denies the miracles. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the, the fish's belly, and he said, "Now you know, keep in mind that what he's saying here is is being said in the past tense. So uh, this is uh, no doubt." what he prayed while he was in the be belly but it's been recounted after the fact and it has a lot of similarity to psalms to uh, the way psalms are written but anyway uh, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and it, it's a shame that Jonah hadn't prayed to the Lord his God before he made this uh, ill-advised trip or tried this ill-advised trip to Tarshish but nevertheless he did he said I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me you know God wants to see a contriteness of uh, one's heart when they repent of something and you can have some sort of outward manifestation but it is if it is not occasioned by a change of the heart or contriteness of heart then it's of really no value so he had a contriteness of heart I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction he knew where where to go to get uh, an answer to his uh, need out of the belly of Sheol I cried Sheol is here uh, King James may say pit or something like that but it's just an unseen place out of the, and of course being in the belly of a fish pretty much unseen out of the belly of the shield I cried and you heard my voice for you cast me in the deep into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me and your billows and your waves passed over me 
<clears throat> so he's describing a very dire situation that uh, uh, without the miraculous uh, aspect of it, any normal uh, person like this would be dead. Then I said in verse 4, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Well, he knew where the uh, he should be uh, looking to find relief from his present situation. The waters encompassed me even to my soul. He was near death. He knew that he was uh, uh, in a situation where he could die. The deep closed around me, weeds were wrapped around my head, and I'm, I'm assuming these are kind of like seaweeds, they were wrapped around his head, no telling what was in the stomach of that fish, <coughs> and he couldn't do anything about it. You can well imagine that being in the uh, such a confined space, he was not able to move his arms or uh, hands at all. He said, I went down to the moorings of the the mountains, he went down deep. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought me, uh, brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. So he is appealing to uh, God for relief from his situation. And he recognized that that's where that relief had to come from and no other place. When my soul, in verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. So he knows the place where the, uh, uh, he should be praying. Lord's in his holy temple. Uh, that's where the prayer should go. He said, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. There is no mercy, no relief from worthless idols. It is only in the uh, all-merciful God of heaven. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Again, he's appealing to God that uh, his salvation, his deliverance from his present situation is coming from the Lord in no other place. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah into dry land. Now, I don't know how a fish does that, but I don't need to know. <laughs> but it uh, happened. So Jonah was delivered from the, uh, uh, the stomach of the uh, fish. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Now it may be that uh, uh, during this interim that Jonah returned to his home. It doesn't say that, but it almost, you know, sounds like that uh, he was spoken to again in, in his hometown. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. First time he was instructed, he was to cry out the message, which is still uh, maybe has the idea of the force with which he was to do the preaching. But he was to preach. So Jonah arose. And that kind of gives the idea he may have been at his home at the time. And went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. Now, I don't know exactly how far three-day journey is. Uh, if you're walking, of course, it's going to be shorter distance than if you're riding. But also keep in mind that Jonah was preaching the entire time, so he he couldn't uh, exactly walk at a crisp pace and still preach. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
Yeah, did uh, Jonah preach anything else other than that? Is that all he said? Well, I'm, I'm sure being a preacher that he said more than that. But this is the message. Now you uh, uh, kind of boil it down to the essence of the message. This was the message. In 40 days, if, Nineveh, if you don't repent, you're going to be overthrown. And keep in mind that uh, Nineveh at this time was in some sort of political um, distress. <clears throat> they were being pressured, <clears throat> being pressured by uh, other nations around the battle. So they they were in kind of a weak. There's a, there's a period of about 60 years in which they were suffering from some sort of political weakness, pressure from their their uh, uh, enemies around about. <clears throat> so they may have been more susceptible to uh, this message than they would, would be otherwise. And that's a good lesson for us today, I think, that sometimes <clears throat> uh, the best time to approach somebody with the message of the gospel is when they're under distress. When you know, if they, they are fat and happy and, you know, the IRA is up, you know, their 401K is doing well and, uh, you know, they got a new car in, in the garage and uh, they're keeping up with the mortgage payments or got it paid off, whatever. Sometimes it's hard to appeal to them uh, for, uh, with uh, messages about their spiritual needs. You know, that, that their idea may, may be that, well, I've got everything I need. So sometimes it's just a good thing that people do go through distress, that they are more receptive to the gospel message. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And sackcloth is just a uh, indication of their uh, repentance. Sackcloth, you know, would, nowadays would, well, some of us would call it a tote sack, but I think probably, uh, especially if it's younger people, you don't know what a tote sack is. But the tote sack is very coarse material, not very comfortable to wear. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I was going to say this a moment ago, but, you know, all we have is the statement that he did say 40 days and then he shall be overthrown. You know, whatever. You know, in a way of saying, I know he said something else. I don't know. Well, I'd, I'd say also that, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, Jonah went back to his home, but it could be very likely that uh, the mariners relayed, you know, that they, they're going back between Joppa and all, you know, all the time. It may have very well been that uh, they relayed to the people there exactly what happened to Jonah. They threw him overboard, and, and here he is. And so that word may have gotten around even to the uh, Ninevites. So they may have been very much impressed by uh, whatever Jonah said, however uh, long or short the message was. But the essence of the message, uh, I don't care what else he said, the essence of the message is, you know, uh, 40 days. you got 40 days, and, and uh, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And we don't know when he went back to God. We don't know that. What I'm saying, the mariners may have, you know, they were traveling. He could, and we we don't know that. 
you know, just it's just speculation. But uh, but they listened to Jonah. The fact of the matter is, you know, whatever, he, however extensive or whatever little he said, the essence of what he said is yet 40 days and, and then it was going to be overthrown. And they listened to that message. You know, whatever other evidence they had, don't know. You can speculate, but you really don't know. And it's not important to the message of Jonah to know. Yeah, that's one thing we need to keep in mind. So, well. They did. They did, and we we get to where the, uh, uh, the king. You know, kings are kind of stubborn people. <laughs> they don't uh, readily accept what other people say. They've got their own mind about things, but not so with the king of uh, of uh, Syria. He said it. The king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne and laid aside his uh, robe, covered himself with a sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, this is very common for someone that uh, is trying to display remorse over something or other. They put on sackcloth and, and sit in ashes. So <clears throat> he was readily uh, convinced by the message. And he repented also now when I, when I say that uh, they repented I don't know that they actually became uh, proselytes anything like that because I know later that they were condemned again you know when we get to the book of Nahum we'll see that in other places we'll we'll see that uh, but right now they did they did change their ways and when the uh, pressure, outside pressure, was alleviated, they may return exactly back to what they were doing before. Yes, sir. I can't, uh, you know, nobody, no one likes to go through uh, a national turmoil or even, even personal tor turmoil, but sometimes uh, that achieves a very beneficial end because it strips away all pretense of, uh, uh, you know, that you're, you can sustain your own well-being without some outside help in this case uh, God you know I think a lot today people are have so divorced themselves from any sort of uh, relationship with God that they don't even realize the trouble that they're in they don't realize it and they don't nowadays they don't see the need of it you go to Europe you got, I, I know they're denominational churches, but in terms of uh, spirituality, it doesn't exist. Very, very few churches. So many churches have been turned into resale shops and, and what have you. It's just, it's just not there. So uh, I think the history will uh, demonstrate time and time again that people sometimes must reach a very low point and maybe political disaster must uh, be visited upon a nation before it realizes as Jonah did his need for God and our need for God and we're getting 
at least in my view, we're getting further and further away from that as a nation. And uh, what we'll find from these uh, amount of prophets is that God holds nations accountable just as he does the individual. Because it's individuals that, you know, make up the nation. So, any other comments? Yes, yeah, so, you know, the, that sort of thing is bad, yes, but sometimes it uh, it reminds people that they, they cannot rely upon their own devices, that they must appeal to higher authority than themselves. So that can't be a, a bad in that respect. I remember uh, when I was in school, a professor was somebody complained about the lack of uh, spirituality on the part of some, and the professor said, "Keep in mind that there will be funerals, which mean that those people, eventually, they're going to be gone." and be a new uh, set of people there. So there's hope for that new set of people. Well, just stay seated just a moment while uh, JD does his magic. And I think he has, so thank you for your presence. We'll take up here uh, next week.